Good morning. Today, I'm going to read you a story from 1905, The Gift of the Magi by O. Henry, in which I'll also be introducing the idea of sentimentality and schmaltz at the end. After I read the story, there's going to be a few slides of follow-up questions. What I want you to think about in particular is the notion of money and value, because these are also discussions that we are having in The Great Gatsby. $1.87, that was all. She had put it aside, one cent and then another, and then another, in her careful buying of meat and other food. Della counted it three times, $1.87, and the next day would be Christmas. There was nothing to do but fall on the bed and cry. So Della did it. While the lady of the home is slowly growing quieter, we can look at the home. Furnished rooms at a cost of $8 a week. There is little more to say about it. In the hall below was a letter box, too small to hold a letter. There was an electric bell, but it could not make a sound. Also, there was a name beside the door, Mr. James Dillingham Young. When the name was placed there, Mr. James Dillingham Young was being paid $30 a week. Now, when he was being paid only $20 a week, the name seemed too long and important. It should perhaps have been Mr. James D. Young. But when Mr. James Dillingham Young entered the furnished rooms, his name became very short indeed. Mrs. James Dillingham Young put her arms warmly about him and called him Jim. You have already met her. She is Della. Della finished her crying and cleaned the marks of it from her face. She stood by the window and looked out with no interest. Tomorrow would be Christmas day and she had only $1.87 with which to buy Jim a gift. She had put aside as much as she could for months with this result. $20 a week is not much. Everything had cost more than she had expected. It always happened like that. Only $1.87 to buy a gift for Jim, her Jim. She had had many happy hours planning something nice for him, something nearly good enough, something almost worth the honor of belonging to Jim. There was a looking glass between the windows of the room. Perhaps you have seen the kind of looking glass that is placed in $8 furnished rooms. It was very narrow. A person could only see a little of himself at a time. However, if he was very thin and moved very quickly, he might be able to get a good view of himself. Della, being quite thin, had mastered this art. Suddenly, she turned from the window and stood before the glass. Her eyes were shining brightly, but her face had lost its color. Quickly, she pulled down her hair and let it fall to its complete length. The James Dillingham Youngs were very proud of two things which they owned. One thing was Jim's gold watch. It had once belonged to his father, and long ago, it had belonged to his father's father. The other thing was Della's hair. If a queen had lived in the rooms near theirs, Della would have washed and dried her hair where the queen could see it. Della knew her hair was more beautiful than any queen's jewels and gifts. If a king had lived in the same house, with all his riches, Jim would have looked at his watch every time they met. Jim knew that no king had anything so valuable. So now, Della's beautiful hair fell about her, shining like a falling stream of brown water. It reached below her knee. It almost made itself into a dress for her. And then she put it up on her head again, nervously and quickly. Once she stopped for a moment and stood still while a tear or two ran down her face. She put on her old brown coat she put on her old brown hat. With the bright light still in her eyes, she moved quickly out the door and down the street. Where she stopped, the sign said, Mrs. Sofroni, hair articles of all kinds. Up to the second floor, Della ran and stopped to get her breath. Mrs. Sofroni, large, two white, cold eyes, looked at her. Will you buy my hair? Asked Della. I buy hair, said Mrs. Sofroni. Take off your hat and let me look at it. Down fell the brown waterfall. Twenty dollars, said Mrs. Sofroni, lifting the hair to feel its weight. Give it to me quick, said Della. Oh, and the next two hours seemed to fly. 
she was going from one shop to another to find a gift for Jim. She found it at last. It surely had been made for Jim and no one else. There was no other like it in any of the shops, and she had looked in every shop in the city. It was a gold watch chain, very simply made. Its value was in its rich and pure material. Because it was so plain and simple, you knew that it was very valuable. All good things are like this. It was good enough for the watch. As soon as she saw it, she knew that Jim must have it. It was like him, quietness and value. Jim and the chain both had quietness and value. She paid $21 for it, and she hurried home with the chain and 87 cents. With that chain on his watch, Jim could look at his watch and learn the time anywhere he might be. Though the watch was so fine, it had never had a fine chain. He sometimes took it out and looked at it, only when no one could see him do it. When Della arrived home, her mind quieted a little. She began to think more reasonably. She started to try to cover the sad marks of what she had done. Love and large-hearted giving, when added together, can leave deep marks. It is never easy to cover these marks, dear friends, never easy. Within 40 minutes, her head looked a little better. With her short hair, she looked wonderfully like a schoolboy. She stood at the looking glass for a long time. If Jim doesn't kill me, she said to herself, before he looks at me a second time, he'll say I look like a girl who sings and dances for money. But what could I do? Oh, what could I do with a dollar and 87 cents? At seven, Jim's dinner was ready for him. The door opened and Jim stepped in. He looked very thin and he was not smiling. Poor fellow, he was only 22 and with a family to take care of. He needed a new coat and he had nothing to cover his cold hands. Jim stopped inside the door. He was as quiet as a hunting dog when it is near a bird. His eyes looked strangely at Della and there was an expression in them that she could not understand and it filled her with fear. It was not anger, nor surprise, nor anything she had been ready for. He simply looked at her with that strange expression on her face. Della went to him. Jim, dear, she cried, don't look at me like that. I had my hair cut off and sold it. I couldn't live through Christmas without giving you a gift. My hair will grow again. You won't care, will you? My hair grows very fast. It's Christmas, Jim, let's be happy. You don't know what a nice, what a beautiful, nice gift I got for you. You cut off your hair, asked Jim slowly. He seemed to labor to understand what had happened. He seemed not to feel sure he knew. Cut it off and sold it, said Della. Don't you like me now? I'm me, Jim. I'm the same girl without my hair. Jim looked around the room. You say your hair is gone, he said. You don't have to look for it, said Della. It's sold, I tell you, sold and gone too. It's the night before Christmas, boy. Be good to me, because I sold it for you. Maybe the hairs of my head could be counted, she said, but no one could ever count my love for you. Shall we eat dinner, Jim? Jim put his arms around his Della. For 10 seconds, let us look in another direction. $8 a week or a million dollars a year. How different are they? Someone may give you an answer, but it will be wrong. The Magi brought valuable gifts, but that was not among them. My meaning will be explained soon. From inside the coat, Jim took something tied in paper. He threw it upon the table. I want you to understand me, Dell, he said. Nothing like a haircut could make me love you any less. But if you'll open that, you may know what I felt when I came in. White fingers pulled off the paper, and then a cry of joy, and then a change to tears. For there lay the combs, the combs that Della had seen in a shop window and loved for a long time. Beautiful combs with jewels, perfect for her beautiful hair. She had known they cost too much for her to buy them. She had looked at them without the least hope of owning them, and now they were hers, but her hair was gone. But she held them to her heart and at last was able to look up and say, my hair grows so fast, Jim. And then she jumped up and cried, oh, oh, Jim had not yet seen his beautiful gift. She held it out to him in her open hand. The gold seemed to shine softly as if with her own warm and loving spirit. Isn't it perfect, Jim? 
I hunted all over town to find it. You'll have to look at your watch a hundred times a day now. Give me your watch. I want to see how they look together. Jim sat down and smiled. Della, said he, let's put our Christmas gifts away and keep them for a while. They're too nice to use now. I sold the watch to get the money to buy the combs. And now I think we should have our dinner. The Magi, as you know, were wise men, wonderfully wise men, who brought gifts to the newborn Christ child. They were the first to give Christmas gifts. Being wise, their gifts were doubtless wise ones. And here I have told you the story of two children who were not wise. Each sold the most valuable thing he owned in order to buy a gift for the other. But let me speak a last word to the wise of these days. Of all who give gifts, these two were the most wise. Of all who give and receive gifts, such as they are, the most wise. Such as they are the most wise. Everywhere they are the most wise. They are the wise ones. They are the magi. All right. So I want to talk about four literary ideas in this story and how it affects our reading of it. Let's look at those similes. If a queen had lived in the room near theirs, Della would have washed and dried her hair where the queen could see it. Della knew her hair was more beautiful than any queen's jewels and gifts. If a king had, li king had lived in the same house with all his riches, Jim would have looked at his watch every time they met. Jim knew that no king had anything so valuable. So here clearly we're setting up the poor um, couple that's in love, Jim and Della, against the idea of royalty and jewels, right? And what's interesting here is in both similes, we have the sense of Jim and Della showing off their objects to these people of a much higher class. Whereas later on we learn, especially with Jim, he looks at his watch where no one can see it. And so we're introducing very early on the idea of value versus wealth. The other thing that dominates the story and gives it its title is the eponymous biblical illusion, the Magi. The Magi, as you know, were wise men, wonderfully wise men who brought gifts to the newborn Christ child, right? So the gold, frankincense, and myrrh that are rooted in especially a Western cultural consciousness. Well, a post-biblical one, post-New Test, post Testament one. And we have a deep sense of, by introducing them, we have the idea of why do you give gifts? What does a gift mean? It's one of the most complicated issues of the entire story, thinking about the title here and the narrator's intervention. Another literary element that we have is the difference between parallelism and a twist ending. Were you surprised when Jim said, I sold the watch to get the money to buy the combs? Or did you see it coming? And so if you saw it coming, that's because you recognized the parallelism, that each of the lovers was doing the same action simultaneously, even though we weren't following Jim and didn't know about the poems beforehand. Or did you find it to be a twist ending? Suddenly it turned out, oh, Jim had done this thing and so it didn't get the value, well, it didn't get the worth, I think, of that watch chain. And so these are two different ideas, but some people will say, oh, this story has a twist ending. But I think if you recognize early on the levels of parallelism, you're expecting it. And then lastly, we have what's called a direct address narrator. And here I have told you the story of two children who were not wise. The narrator is speaking to us, the reader, right? That's the you, I have told you, I have told you reader of this, this story. And something about direct address narrators is they can come across as heavy handed. And this is going to lead us into the questions that I have for you. So before we get there though, there's a piece of follow-up that I wanna do. And I want you to think about this question. I'm not gonna have you post really about it on the forum, although you can include elements of it. Is the story trying to say something profound or is it pulling on your emotions in too manipulative a way? Is it heavy handed or genuine? Think about how the narrative authoritative voice adds or detracts from the story itself, right? By ha adding the narrator on top of this already sentimental story, is that too much? 
or does it work? Do you like being addressed by the narrator? Does you find it comforting? And I want to use this to introduce four types of sentimentality. And these are ranked in kind of a personal order, but it's largely, I think, the way they come across. So sentimental has a little bit of a negative connotation. It's this direct appeal to your emotions. It's the use of a story elements in order to make you feel something rather than perhaps letting that emotion rise organically or be open to a variety of different interpretations of emotion. Under sentimentality, I think we have something like schmaltz. Schmaltz etymologically is rendered chicken fat, but it comes to me like uh, a flavor, but specifically an excessively sentimental flavor. So if sentimental is just like kind of a surface level going a little bit beyond that, it becomes schmaltz or schmaltzy. Beyond that, and kind of in a different direction, is saccharin. Saccharin, etymologically, is sweet, sugar. And here it's almost a cloying. It's something when you, if you take too much candy in your mouth at one time, your mouth kind of stops being able to open and shut. This is excessively sweet slash excessive, excessively sentimental. So I don't think this story is saccharin because it is going for more of a sad verge, sad emotion. And that puts us in this idea of the maudlin. Maudlin is something that is weakly emotional. And it's associated kind of historically with getting drunk and teary-eyed about emotional issues. But it's something that's maudlin is really meant to pull out the tears from you. So I'm curious if you guys find in this ranking how you might place this story. But here are the questions that I have for you. One, does this story indicate the strength of love between Jim and Della or the weakness of the love between Jim and Della? Why? So some things to consider here. Do you consider the parallel sacrifices as indicative of love or of a lack of communication? Right? If they had just talked to each other rather than trying to surprise, none of this would have happened. Do they sell the objects to make themselves happy or to make their partner happy or to make them both happy? Right? What might be the motivation that lies behind this action? And then another question to get you kind of thinking, what is the symbolic argument you could make about using a watch and hair as the objects that are sold? So that'll require you to put together kind of an argument. I mean, both of them will, but one, they let you use different tools that you have and to activate different levels of your understanding of how to use literary terminology. Um, okay, I hope I didn't make you guys cry and uh, keep thinking about this as a story of poverty and the difference between value and worth.